thank you everyone for joining us for uh, the webinar, Wheels and Legs, Reducing Non-Motorized Trails Conflicts. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 142nd webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. And this webinar is free thanks to a generous sponsorship from Rhino Marking and Protection Systems. Uh, the free webinar, it's being recorded. Uh, it includes real-time closed captioning in English, and it offers learning credits. And links for both the closed captioning and the learning credits will be in the chat box if you don't already see them there. Attendees will receive a closed caption transcript and a link to the recording in my follow-up email. And the CEU quiz was, uh, will also be emailed to attendees who requested interesting credits in a separate email. Um, and these emails are going to be sent within one to three business days um, following the webinar. And we are saving time for attendee questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, we welcome you, though, to send your questions at any time during today's presentation via the questions box. And I want to thank uh, today's uh, additional webinar partners that include the Bureau of Land Management, uh, the Federal Highway Administration, the U.S. Forest Service, and the National Park Service. And I am excited to introduce today's webinar presenters. Uh, we have Dennis Benson, who is the Recreation Program Manager with the USDA Forest Service out of the Deschutes National Forest. We have Ryan O'Hario, who is Southwest Regional Manager with Washington Trails Association. We have Dion Vanderwoody, who is the Human Dimensions Supervisor with the City of Boulder, Open Space and Mountain Parks. Uh, Kurt Kruger, who is the co-founder and current director of Trail Par uh, Partners, as well as Bob Cerns, owner um, of Robert Cerns and Associates, and who is also our moderator for today's webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and give control over to Bob to start today's presentation. Thank you, Candice, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, we welcome all our viewers uh, worldwide. And um, I'll give a little talk about where we're going. I live in Ken Carroll Ranch, a planned Colorado community of about 20,000 people. It's a conservation subdivision with 6,000 acres of open space and miles of both paved and dirt surfaced uh, backcountry trails. I hike and I bike, and I do one or the other usually daily. In recent years on the trails, I noticed increasing number of folks uh, on bikes, particularly on the dirt trails. And I began to wonder, how is this affecting the trail experience, particularly the sense of solace? I wondered about the safety and wear and tear on the trails, wildlife, and the landscape. Apparently, I wasn't the only one uh, because of the, the issue of bikes versus peds began to flare up with letters to the editor of the local newspaper and uh, contentious HOA meetings. More recently, it became a full-blown kerfuffle with uh, youth bike racing clubs uh, wanting a permit to train on our trails. Uh, by the way, I read that mountain biking is now the fastest growing high school sport. So I began to ask some of my colleagues with the local space, uh, open space agencies about the issue. And uh, also feeling like uh, maybe a deeper examination was needed. Uh, I contacted Candace with American Trails and suggested this webinar. With American Trails OK, I recruited our four presenters today who are experts in trail and open space management, and they very graciously agreed. I'm also uh, pleasantly surprised that we have over a thousand people who showed up today to see this webinar. So I guess I'm not the only one wondering. Uh, also, by way of context, I looked at various studies. The Outdoor Industry Foundation said that uh, 40 million in the U.S. Uh, mountain bike, and no doubt there are multiples of this worldwide. Some 80 million people hike in the U.S., and globally it's over 120 million people. Uh, combined mountain biker and hiker uh, activity is a 17 plus billion dollar industry worldwide, and it's growing from 7 to 12 percent annually. So this is a pretty big industry. Uh, there's a lot of people engaging, and it's rapidly increasing. <laughs> Throw in e-bikes, and uh, we now have, uh, which is now called the fastest growing segment, and it really gets in this interesting. So we can expect these levels of use, crowding, and conflicts to increase. 
And uh, I think that's the challenge that we're gonna be looking at. May I have the next slide, Candace? Anyway, these are, are some of the questions that uh, we're gonna be looking at today with our, our panelists. And, um, but before we do that, I thought it might also be helpful to get a bit of a citizen perspective. So uh, I went out and talked with a couple of my neighbors, uh, one who's kind of a, a biking enthusiast and the other more of a hiking enthusiast uh, to give us a little bit of uh, unscientific, informal, but very real perspective. And so Candace, if you can run the video of my uh, two neighbors who very kindly agreed to comment. Hey, Danny McGarry here. I'm, uh, I'm an active trail user, but also a, a very active trail volunteer. I come from the philosophy of, you know, give more than you take if you can and uh, pay for what you play. And uh, over the years, I've done a lot of volunteer work, uh, building new trails, learning about sustainable trail development and why it's important to build those uh, trails in certain ways involved in conservation efforts as well as our homeowners association as a board member and I learned about land management policies and uh, even developing a trails master plan. I even served a year as the president of our trail club. But you know when I think of trail users and the trail experience, um, you know user conflicts I think is a topic that comes up and I think we need to uh, you know, kind of shift the narrative to more of uh, user harmony, you know, changing our mindset. Uh, it's clear that sometimes, you know, a biker may not understand that the hiker is uncomfortable with their speed, or the hiker may not understand that it's not just a hiker-biker conversation, it's a, it's a hiker-runner, or skier, cross-country skier, snowshoer, fat biker, e-biker, downhill biker, horseback rider. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, how can we Kind of move forward with this it's you know obviously our land management policies land managers need to review and uh, work for the best community as a whole but uh, as an individual you know what can we do i think the big thing is just be nice and respectful and i don't think that's too big of an ask but thanks so much just to set the scene before giving you my views on mountain biking i'm an avid outdoor person and enjoy all forms of outdoor activities, including uh, hiking, skiing, and fishing, and cycling. In my youth, I spent six months cycling around England, Wales, and Ireland. So I'm not anti-cyclist. The exponential increase in mountain biking on our backcountry trails has led to a much poorer experience for the walker and the hiker, and has negatively impacted the environment and the animal habitat. Local authorities and communities have not reacted fast enough to update the regulations to protect the environment and to segregate the hikers and the mountain bikers and due to this a precedent has now been set that mountain biking is acceptable for, for our backcountry trails. Over, over the years I've watched the degradation of our local trail system and the negative impact on the wildlife habitat as can be seen from the following pictures. The trails have widened, bird, berms have been created and the soil has been badly eroded. The trails are, are now very rutted. All of this creates a very bad experience for the walker, the hiker as well as negatively impacts the flora and fauna. To address this, I would like to see the local authorities take the following steps. Update the regulations on the use of mountain biking on our backcountry trails that are in sensitive environments. Set aside land or trails for the mountain bikers in areas that are not sensitive, as the hikers and bikers cannot coexist. Stop the expansion of new trails to protect what little unspoilt open space we have left. I will make a prediction that activity, there will be an increase in conflicts and acrimony due to environmental damage, harm to the animal habitat, and degradation of the hiker experience. It is up to all of us to find solutions and protect what we have, even if it is just at the local community level. And now we'd like to go ahead and move ahead with our presenters. And our first presenter is Dennis Benson. 
And uh, Dennis has worked for the U.S. Forest Service for 34 years and is currently the Recreation Program Manager for the Jesuits National Forest in Bend, Oregon. He and his agency are working on uh, proactive approaches to potential conflicts and uh, both short and long-term solutions to provide enjoyable recreational experiences while protecting fragile resources, engaging the use of technology management and empowering presenters and volunteers. Dennis? Good morning, everybody. Candace, can you see my presentation? Gonna assume so. So good morning. My name is Dennis Benson and I'm the Recreation Program Manager on the Deschutes National Forest in Central Oregon. I've lived and worked in Bend since 2013. In my time here, I've seen and witnessed dramatic changes in overall forest use. The public mindset and use of new and innovative technology that is meant to help the public enjoy their public lands, but at what cost? Increased user conflicts, resource damage, and changes in user experience. My presentation today focuses on and will provide an example of what's going on at the ground level, and I'll also bring to your attention what the Forest Service, a federal land managing agency, is doing to help provide some solutions to tough recreation management issues. This photograph is No Name Lake off the north side of Broken Top Mountain in the Three Sisters Wilderness. There is no formal trail into this moraine basin. However, it is very, very popular. If you're interested, that's my dog Raja following me down the hill. I'm not on for 45 minutes. Long ago, John Muir, someone whose writings greatly influenced my life and career, resolved to inspire a generation to get outside and enjoy nature. Well, 130 years later, we can say with certainty they've arrived. They've arrived and they keep coming. Today, I love walking where John Muir walked with thousands of other people. My presentation is gonna follow a few storylines that we use on the Deschutes National Forest around increasing use. The storylines are loving it to death, wilderness management. That trail is hey, boring. Dennis, I just wanna yeah. make sure you, we're still seeing your first slide. Oh, I changed it. There we go. Yeah, I see John here now. Perfect. Oh, well, <laughs> we see it now. I'm, it's good. I'm, I'm even. Okay, so you see the the increased use. You see. Some... Yes, we see that. I see the increased use now. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I've got really slow connection. Um. So, back to where I was. Uh, that trail is boring. Managing user created trails. Technology advancements. Look, mom. I'm not even breaking a sweat e-bikes and one wheels, changing user, users. But that trail was built for and created for equestrians. Here's a general overview of our increased use on the Deschutes National Forest over the last nine years. Every five years, we use a program called the National Visit Use Monitoring to collect basic forest user information, like total use, user demographics, and what they are coming to the forest to do. In 2013, when I arrived, total forest visitors was around 1.8 million visitors. In 2018, five years later, we were at 3.2 million visitors and climbing. In 2020, we estimated more than 4 million visitors. The bottom line, we saw a dramatic increase in use with COVID-19. In 2021, we seem to have flattened out a bit, but our use is still higher than we are equipped to manage. In 2023, we'll be collecting a new data set. The next storyline, loving it to death. 
wilderness management in the modern era. I don't have time to get into the details today, but the Wilderness Act defines a wilderness as a wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. This is a quote by Howard Zanizer. It is our responsibility as federal land managers to manage wilderness for the enjoyment of future generations. Here's a brief overview of our wilderness program. The Deschutes National Forest and Willamette National Forest jointly manage five wilderness areas. Mount Jefferson, Mount Washington, Three Sisters, Diamond Peak, and Mount Bielsen. We've witnessed a dramatic increase in wilderness use from 1991 to 2016, from 40,000 visitors annually to well over 100,000 visitors. This triggered the need to do something different. Between population growth, tourism, and more people wanting to recreate outside, this has increased use at the local level and obviously translated into increased use of our wild places. Three Sisters Wilderness use has increased 231% from 1991 to 2016. This dramatic change in use and other factors led to a major change in management direction for the two national forests. In 2021, we implemented a new permit system with the intent of reducing overall use to reduce conflicts, improve wilderness character, and protect important resource values. The first impressions are it was very successful. The next storyline is, that trail is boring. User-created trails is another forest challenge. Places like No Name Lake, which was my first slide, have become very popular, but most people don't realize the difficult trail to the lake is a user-created trail. The current trail location is not designated or the use we get has impacted sensitive biological species and has been the subject of many user conflicts as it's difficult to manage. In this next photo, um, I circled some mistakes. Please note from the photo the incorrect information being provided by public sources. Broken Top's crater is a moraine, not a crater as described. Also, there is no camping at the lake and the dogs are allowed off leash. It's one of Raja's favorite places. Public misinformation is problematic, causing user conflict, and can be challenging to manage. Trails have evolved dramatically over the last 100 years. From game trails, to separated motorized and non-motorized trail systems, to reduce and avoid user conflicts. In both cases, some users are not content with how this worked out. Some user groups continue to develop and expand trail opportunities to meet their demand for new routes or greater challenge. A lot of this driven by te technological advancement of equipment. It doesn't help that our forest ecosystem, not steep and brushy, allows for the easy creation of routes across an open timbered landscape. We, are currently, we have currently mapped and inventoried more than 450 miles of unauthorized or user created trails on the Deschutes National Forest. Here's a question. How do we effectively manage trails that the public is developing without our knowledge? The next storyline. Technological advancement. Look, mom, I'm not even breaking a sweat. One wheels and e-bikes. These new technologies are taking up a lot of time. Technology is increasing so fast, it's hard for federal agencies to keep up. One wheels, those battery operated balance board surfing like experience crossing public lands. Then there's e-bikes, pedal assisted to fully powered. Our bike shops are selling these things like hotcakes. 
Federal agencies are taking different approaches, causing confusion with the public. Please note, many of our publics don't know the difference between the different land managing agencies. Do you? The Department of Interior, their land managers, they've accepted new technology, and you might see e-bikes on BLM managed lands. Or the US Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service, who I work for, has not. And we manage our roads and trails based on access and travel management principles that separate motorized use from non-motorized use. This is very challenging and complicated uh, emerging issue. Our next storyline, changing uses. But that trail was built for and created for equestrians. Some of our traditional users, equestrians to be specific, are now having to compete with new types of uses. Here's an example, the Metolius Wendigo Trail, trail number 99, a more than 120 mile long trail was established by local equestrian groups who wanted another experience off the Pacific Crest Trail. This trail was formally recognized in 1980 and received the designation of an Oregon Scenic Trail. The Forest Service, in partnership with the equestrian groups, developed multiple horse camps along the route. Then in 2018, another group looking for a similar experience off the Pacific Crest Trail proposed designating a new cross-state mountain bike route called the Oregon Timber Trail. They proposed to use the Metolius Wendigo Trail, trail number 99, for their route across the Deschutes National Forest. Mountain biking is an allowed use on most equestrian trails, but concerns were raised that this may increase conflicts along this trail in high use areas. We are currently working with both groups to identify conflict areas, propose other routes, or build parallel routes if necessary. We're very involved in a lot of creative solutions. Here are a few solutions we are currently working on. Wilderness management, um, I talked with you at first around our new wilderness permit. We're also working on a multimodal trail system. We are currently working in partnership with the Oregon Department of Transportation to develop a multimodal trail system that connects central Oregon communities with public lands. There are plans over the next 10 years to link the communities of Bend and Sun River with the 26 to 30 mile paved trail that highlights several of our most popular recreation sites or areas, the High Desert Museum, Lava Lands Visitor Center, Deschutes River, and the Cascade Lakes Highway. Future designated trail systems. So in, in the future, if we look at a new designated trail system, we're gonna have to look at and analyze for motorized use such as e-bikes. Parallel trails. Um, we've been doing this for many years, um, but it's also very expensive and impacts other resources. Now there's the development of the decision support system. We've been seeking tools to assess our trails using the natural, national sustainable sustainability model. We are working on several tools including a rapid trail assessment, sustainable trails assessment tool, otherwise known as the STAT, and the development of a decision support system. A decision support system using technology to measure a trail sustainability, which includes social, economic, and ecologic values. A DSS is a computer system being developed in partnership with the Deschutes Trails Coalition using crowdsourcing data and fuzzy logic database information to capture social and economic data while identifying areas of sensitive economic ecologic values. The goal is to help managers quickly and easily assess existing and future trail systems based on a sustainable trail model to better understand where to best invest both public and agency funds for future management. This is a much bigger topic than we have time to cover today. These are a few examples from the Deschutes National Forest. 
from the last few years, nationally, we saw a 40% increase in overall use, not only nationwide, but around the globe. I appreciate the opportunity to share our story. I'm interested in your story and other solutions as well. I'm hoping this helps you to better understand some of the on the ground issues public land managers are facing and some of the solutions we are working through to address them in the future. Just a note, here is a photo from Sandy Ann Pass. Back in the day, user conflicts are not new, but they are more complex. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dennis. Our next presenter is Ryan O'Hario, and he is uh, Southwest Regional Manager uh, for the Washington Trails Association. He's been involved in trail advocacy, planning, construction, and maintenance for the last 13 years with the WTA. He brings, in my mind, an intriguing and unique perspective, particularly with respect to trail user perceptions, the experience, and people's diverse expectations, including uh, what he refers to as the concept of flow, uh, which is an integral part of a trail user experience. Ryan? Hey, thanks, Bob. I just want to do a check here that folks are seeing my title slide and the laser pointer that's underlining the title. How's that coming through on your end, Bob? Very good. Thank you. Awesome. All right, let's see how this works. Thanks for the introduction. Um, just a little bit more background for me. Uh, when I first encountered the flow experience prior to working at Washington Trails Association, I was a student at the University of Oregon and I was teaching uh, mountain biking and rock climbing and I took a class called adventure education and learned about this a psychological phenomenon and how we could apply it to um, providing optimal experiences for our students and it stuck with me as I've carried that over to work with the Washington Trails Association where I'm involved in planning new trails, uh, trail systems, and even the uh, occasional redevelopment of a user-created route into a sustainable system route. So the key points I want to cover with this presentation are that our decisions about trail design and trail system design need to be founded in principles that'll, that are stable over time. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. You know, Dennis talked about changes in technology, but what can we rely on to inform how we make decisions about trail development. And I think that the psychological principle of the flow state is really important and it's something that's enduring. I think human brains are gonna be really similar decades from now or hundreds of years from now as they are today. So we'll talk about what flow is, why flow is important, and then how do you integrate these concepts into a trail system design? And I'll touch on a, on a case study that I'm working on right now. So first of all, some principles that might be familiar to folks who are already engaged in trail maintenance and construction. We talk a lot about soil type. We talk about the landscape. We talk about the grade of the trail and the interaction of climate with the soil conditions that can affect how a trail is gonna change over time. And Troy Scott Parker has a really great book called uh, Native Surface Trails by Design. And it talks about the interaction between all of these variables and the different physical forces that are applied by feet and mountain bike wheels and horse hooves. And using these, you can really predict, you know, what a trail is going to do. And so here's just some examples to drive that point home. If you've got clay soil, you know you're going to end up with a really durable surface when it's dry, but when it's wet, you can predict that it's going to be a mess. Conversely, if you've got pumice soil, really sandy, loose soil, and you run it up a fall line, it's going to trench, it's going to form ruts, and it doesn't really matter what type of user is using it. Given enough time, this is going to be the predictable outcome. And then there's that Goldilocks soil uh, composition where you got a lot of different soil types together. And again, you can predict that you're going to have a really sustainable trail under a lot of conditions if you can put your trail systems on these types of soils. But what about the human mind? Like what's, what's important to understand there? And that's where I bring in this concept of flow or flow mental state. And 
this is not my idea. This uh, is a concept that was coined by a Hungarian psychologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And he studied this in the 70s, and he was really interested at first at artists who would seem to lose themselves in their work to the point where they would forget to eat, they would lose track of time. And so he went on to interview hundreds of people and found that people experienced this flow state of mind in, in a, really a variety of different activities, but they all had some common themes. And so just to define the flow state, I think that this uh, excerpt from somebody that he uh, interviewed illustrates it. And I imagine many of you have had flow experiences. And so this quote is, my mind isn't wandering. I'm not thinking of anything else. I'm totally involved in what I'm doing. My body feels good. I don't see or hear anything. The world seems to be cut off from me and I'm less aware of myself and my problems. And so a lot of folks have studied this and found some correlations between flow experiences and long-term happiness. They found that folks can experience flow um, across all different types of mundane, all the way to extreme sports activities. Um, and they've also done some neurological research that shows that when you're in a flow state, the activity in your prefrontal cortex actually starts to decrease. And so that allows other areas of your brain to be more engaged and be more efficient. And if you're not a neuroscientist, uh, it's helpful to know that the prefrontal cortex is that part of your brain that has to do with analytical problem solving and self-reflection. And so when you have a relaxing experience, I find that that part of your brain fades to the background. Mihai Cheek sent Mihai, whose the spelling is down here right there if you want to Google that later on. Um, also identified eight different characteristics that you commonly find in flow state activities. And so to use an example from my rock climbing days, um, I would find that experience intrinsically rewarding. I just do it for its own sake. It's really clear what I'm trying to do and I get immediate feedback from how I move my hands and feet on the rock wall. And that gives me a feeling of control over what's going on. It's also helpful to have a balance between something that is not too difficult and not so easy that your mind can water and become, wander and become boring. So finding a climb that, that doesn't scare me, um, but is, is, is not uh, too mundane or too boring. When you're in a flow state, there's a sense of effortlessness and ease. And you have that complete concentration. And I found that even on some climbs that I find easy, I'll shift my focus to more of a, like a Tai Chi type movement where I'm focusing on fluid movement, graceful movement, and I can achieve a flow state even when I'm not trying to push the physical limits or push my skill set. So I can find flow in a couple different ways. And when I'm in that mode, I have the sense of transformation of time. And again, my prefrontal cor cortex part really fades to the background and I, I, I lose that self-conscious thinking about what I am doing, who I am, and uh, it's a really enjoyable experience. And so my, my hypothesis is that when you have a great experience out on a trail, it's because you're having a flow state experience or something akin to it. And when you're having a user conflict, you are getting out of that flow state. So if I was to graph this over time with like your satisfaction in the experience or your proximity to being in a flow state, to use that rock climbing experience, you know, I would say that in the beginning of the climb, you're getting your gear ready, you're looking at the route, you're talking to your blayer, you're not, you're really engaging that prefrontal cortex. But that as you get into the route, you warm up your muscles, you start to get in your zone, you start to feel that effortlessness and concentration then you can get into this flow experience. And then mentally you shift, maybe you fall, maybe you complete the route and you decide, what are we gonna do next? And so your experience will have ups and downs, peaks and valleys. So when I go skiing, I experience this, you know, not that super enjoyable period when I'm at the chairlift. Once I get into the run, I start to get into that flow zone. I'm making some great turns. And then as soon as I return to the bottom again, I engage that prefrontal cortex, get into the line of the chairlift, start talking to other people. And so a day of skiing can look like a lot of ups and downs with my mental state. But overall, I have a lot of great runs. 
And so to take a look at this in a, in a hiking or mountain biking context, if I go for a hike and I hardly see anybody, I can stay up in this contemplative flow state zone for a long time. But if I have to interact with a group of other people or a bike or something like that, it might drop me into the valley here where I'm engaging that prefrontal cortex and I'm outside of my flow experience. And so the number of times I encounter other people, it can mean that I never really achieve that calm state of mind. And this, this happens when I'm mountain biking, it happens when I'm uh, hiking, um, whatever activity I do, I, I notice this sense in myself. So when I'm out with my son, we're having a really slow, quiet, intimate experience. We can have kind of that meditative flow. Um, and it's really great when we're alone and quiet and we're just looking for mushrooms and bugs. Out riding with my wife, her flow zone is more active. She's a trail runner, mountain biker. And so we seek trails that can provide that challenge, that physical challenge and a sense of movement. And so, some folks might call this a flow trail in mountain biking parlance. That's a type of trail um, that could be a place for flow experiences, but they're two separate concepts. Now, you don't have to be alone to have a flow experience. A lot of research has shown that you can be in groups of people, team sports, uh, dancing with a partner, and you can have that flow experience. I recently did a trail run out at Mount St. Helens, and um, once we got going and outside, uh, into the backcountry, we fell into a rhythm. And even though I was with the same group of people for a few hours, um, I was really able to get into that meditative flow state and kind of lose track of myself. Where we ran into problems in that race was when we started to get up towards the top, looking into Mount St. Helens, and we started to encounter day hikers who were coming up from uh, the Johnson Ridge Observatory. And so it's midday, they're partway into their hike coming up to see these views. We're partway into our run going the other direction. And they're starting to encounter a couple hundred runners or so coming down the trail as they're coming up. And now my mind is starting to think about how do I get off the trail here? Do I get off the trail there? Oh, that person's pausing for me. I'll go ahead and pick up my pace so I can run by them pretty quickly. Some people were looking at wildflowers and taking pictures while we're running by. And so I can tell that internally I'm feeling that I'm not in the flow state that I was in before because of these encounters with these people on the trail and imagining that they're feeling the same. So all of this activity is going on in my prefrontal cortex. Now, even when there's no people present, you can take a look at a trail and you can see that there's some type of user conflict or something is going on. And in, in this example, I've observed this spot over a number of years. This is in a local park with a, a multi-use trail that gets a lot of use. The original trail is over here on the right. And what I think is going on here, there's two things happening. When people are passing one another, going in opposite directions, rather than pausing and stepping to the side to let somebody pass, on an open landscape, it's fairly easy to just just walk to the side and over time the trail braids and creates these extra channels. So I think that's one thing. People are just wanting to stay in um, in motion. Another thing that's going on is that I think some people are looking for a little bit more challenge and I think this is particularly true of mountain bikers where the original gravel path is kind of boring and so they get a little bit better experience by moving around or jumping over some of these rocks or maybe even climbing up some of these rocks. So in either case, people are looking for a kind of an uninterrupted uh, quality experience when they're out on that trail. And the landscape shows that they're doing it in different ways. This ex other example from the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, this trail here is deeply entrenched. This is a user created route that was adopted into the, form, into the system. As a mountain biker, I find this really fun. I can carry my speed through this corner with minimal amount of braking if I choose the correct speed. But as a hiker, it can be really uh, annoying to walk into these cups. And you can see the people who have walked on the side of the trail are compacting the grass. People also walk on the side of the trail uh, when they encounter other hikers or other bikers coming in the opposite direction. So there's a disruption and a kind of a micro displacement of people in the, in the actual trail um, itself. 
Another example here shows this person's riding up this trail. You can see compaction on the side of the trail where, where people are walking to the side of the cup that's starting to form and they're avoiding some of these little loose rocks that are kind of slippery. But you can also see these tracks. These are mountain bike tracks in the grass where the grass is compacted. These downhill riders are looking for a little bit more challenge, so they're launching off of this rock. So we have a trail that is trying to do multiple things and people are using it in different ways and the impacts are showing up on the landscape. So I've touched on some ideas that, that disrupt the idea of flow. And so I'll go back through that. And it has to do with distracting you, turning on that prefrontal cortex. And there can be different types of interactions. You might have a one-to-one -one interaction, solo hiker encounters a solo hiker, where both people feel like the kind of the same type of, of interaction or disruption. It's equal, it's equal, uh, equal disruption. But you might have a lot of interruptions, like if you encounter a group of trail runners on an event like I was on. And then you have a one-to-many interaction where that solo hiker might have more of a negative uh, experience from that encounter than the people doing that trail run. Similarly, you can have an asymmetric impact if you are moving slowly and you interact with somebody who's moving very fast. So maybe someone who's a cross-country mountain biker is going up a trail and looking for that challenge, but they're encountering a lot of downhill mountain bikers coming in the other direction. So that's a, an example of a fast, slow interaction where that uphill rider encountering a lot of faster people might have an asymmetric impact. And then the like other interaction. I've talked about uh, hikers encountering other hikers, mountain bikers encountering other hikers. When you encounter somebody that's a little different than you or a lot different than you, that can change the quality of the interaction. So these asymmetric impacts can lead to displacement. And you can think about it as a quiet activity will tend to be displaced by a loud activity. Someone going out for bird watching will tend to want to go somewhere else when they encounter a lot of trail runners, for example. Um, someone on a mountain bike on a motorized trail that's open to them might decide to move over somewhere else if they start to encounter faster moving motorcycles. So I, I think it, it, this interaction and displacement can occur across all different types of use. You can also have displacement when folks are bored with the trail experience because it doesn't provide enough challenge and they go off and create user created trails. Or you can have people, and I've heard this in the equestrian community, where they feel a sense of anxiety when they encounter high-speed mountain bikes, so they no longer go to an area or they go to a new area. Lastly, the sense of inclusion and safety can impact you. If you're out with somebody and they're not friendly to you, they don't say hello and they give you the cold shoulder, that impression can last uh, for a while and it can ruin your entire hike. So how do we put this into practice? I'll highlight a few planning strategies that I think are useful obviously reducing interactions and you do that by separating activities in time or place if you can cluster similar activities into zones on the landscape and i think it's important to design for preferred use and so that you can have a really high quality mountain bike trail a really high quality hiking trail and if there's enough um uh, space for folks to interact infrequently in those areas, then you can share those trails pretty successfully. Incentivize directional travel wherever you can. And then try to use single mandate as a last resort, in particularly places where safety is a concern. High speed mountain bike downhill courses are a great example where that really does make a lot of sense. Or if it's bird watching in a wetland area, it really makes sense to really focus on just that one activity. Um, and I like to center my discussions with people not on I'm building trails for mountain bikers or I'm building trails for hikers, but I'm building a trail that's going to be a great place to mountain bike or a great place to hike. And that influences the design. So here's an example where we're trying to put those principles in action, or I'm hoping to. We're engaging in a vision planning process for the Silver Star area. And this is a corner of the Gifford Pinchot National Forest that's abutted by DNR lands. And it's about an hour drive from the Portland, Vancouver metropolitan area. And it's got some incredible scenery, these beautiful vistas. 
Um, it's got a mix of legacy trails. They're old roads that have been converted to trails that go straight up the fall line. It's got some trails that were designed long ago where the grades are a little too steep. As well, it's got some more recently designed trails. Wildflower displays here are amazing during July, and so it's really attractive to hikers. More recently, mountain bikers have put in some trails that follow more modern criteria for designing quality trail experiences as illustrated by this page from the Bureau of Land Management's publications. So as we evolve this system and look at that adding capacity in the years to come, we took a look at Strava data to see where people are recreating. And these red highlighted areas are showing you there's a lot of mountain bike activity on the newer created trails on the DNR side. We also looked at stakeholder interviews and we did a public survey. And out of that, we found that there are zones where people tend to cluster. Equestrians near the equestrian camp tending to avoid the mountain biking trails, hikers up in the higher ridges, and then mountain bikers down in this corner. So looking forward, we're trying to figure out how do we add new trail connections? How do we incentivize flow through the system to reduce interactions? And how do we provide a quality experience for everybody to find their niche? And so to summarize and end, we're looking to apply shared landscape versus always sharing the trails. Think about activity zones before you plan the trail layout and the design. Go for loop trails that encourage directional traffic. Combine compatible uses and separate incompatible uses, particularly as it pertains to speed. And use shared multi-directional trails to move between these activity areas. So that's the end of my presentation. And I'd like to turn it over back to Bob for the next speaker. Thank you, Ryan and Dennis. And Ryan, thank you for laying down an amazing foundation uh, for this uh, session. Uh, just perspectives uh, that I had never really been able to articulate before. I, I took a whole lot of notes. Our next speaker is Dion Vanderwoody, and she is with the human. She's the Human Dimensions Supervisor uh, for Boulder, Colorado's Open Space and Mountain Parks Department, and she oversees a close-in system with close to 160 miles of trails and annual vis visitation exceeding six million. She has worked for 17 years on projects and policies that address many of the aspects of multi-trial activities that we've been talking about, visitor experiences, conflicts, uh, activity distributions, and trail conditions. And she strives to provide the best possible recreation experiences by understanding visitation, planning, and design in daily operations. Uh, Dion? Thanks, Bob. Doing an audio check and making sure I'm on the title slide to those viewing. You are. All right, great. Thank you for that introduction. Um, great presentation so far today. I'm going to speak a little bit about managing for wheels and legs in a municipal open space department environment. So what I'm going to cover today, briefly, four topics, uh, introduction to open space and mountain parks. And right now I'll say when you see OSMP from here on out, that means open space and mountain parks. A little bit about trail design and conflict management and how you can design trails both for high quality experiences and for conflict mitigation what our data says, and then end looking forward with our ongoing monitoring and some future potential management strategies that we're looking at. So very brief introduction to, to OSMP. We are a municipal day use urban proximate open space that offers a variety of recreation opportunities. If you've ever been to Boulder, um, anywhere you go in town, you look around, you're gonna see our property and the trail system that we provide. We do have a very porous boundary, literally hundreds of ways to get in and out. And we're adjacent to many other public lands and trail systems. So we're somewhat nested into a much bigger complex of trails up and down the Front Range. We do have close to 47,000 acres. We're open all of the time, 365 days a year. As Bob mentioned, close to 160 miles of designated trail and about a third of those are open to our cycling community. 
As of 2017, we're a little bit over 6 million annual human visits and about 10% of our visitors uh, identify their primary activity as being cycling. Okay, so how can we use trail design both for visitor experiences that are high quality as well as mitigating potential conflict? Before we get into that just a little bit, I wanted to show a quick map of our multi-use trails themselves. Over there on the left, you can see City of Boulder, Colorado, labeled there in the middle and all of the lime green you see around it is our property with the solid lines, primarily in the north, east, and south being those that allow cycling and the dash lines, primarily in the west that, are, that don't allow for cycling. For those that do, however, they're generally, uh, as I said, in flatter and more open areas. They include less frequent legacy trails, and those are trails that we inherited through acquisition and or otherwise adopted into the trail system that may have had less design, tend to be less sustainable, and require much more time and effort for maintenance. And then most of our multi-use trails are in less dense trail networks, as you can see in the map there, and are newer, so therefore likely include updated design specs. Okay, typical landscape here. You can see a few things going on here, peaks, trees, and cattle guards, uh, where we have chosen here both for visitor experience as for mitigating conflict. You can see two systems of getting through this point on the trail with the cattle guard there on the right, for cyclists to move through, keep the cattle in, the bikers can go on through without having to dismount and everybody else can use the gate there on the left. And a lot of other things that we use, our trail staff use very intentionally, both for design and for mitigating things that we're talking about today. So they're looking at the topography, what are the landscape features there, what is the hydrology, the drainage? Uh, as Ryan mentioned, the soil types can be really important. Grades that we're going for in the area, what is gonna be the cross slope and the out slope. Again, designing all these things, uh, both for the best possible user experience, as well as intentionally designing for speed control and reduction of conflict. While they're doing all these things, of course, they're considering lots of other things like ecological and cultural resources alongside what is the desired visitor experience in the area and what do we know about uh, expected use, both in amount and type to be expected for that area. Specific to speed control and minimizing for conflict, there's a lot of things that our trail staff use, things such as very intentional sight lines, um, addition of switchbacks, they look at grade reversals, use pinch points often um, anchored in landscape features. They're using dips and rollers, texturized treads, which is that picture there on the left, thanks to Bo Clark in the trails program. And again, um, always thinking about what is the expected use level and type in the area and what is the visitor experience we're going for here. So one thing I did want to highlight, I um, honestly didn't know what texturized tread was. And for speaking with our trail staff, they brought it up as a way to improve visitor experience while mitigating for speed. And so Bo sent me this picture and it really highlighted to me, it was a learning opportunity. What a great thing, um, both visually and experientially. Another great picture uh, that shows a lot of uh, integration of the things that I just covered. Okay, so getting into the data, as Bob said, uh, the program that I run does a lot of data collection as well as colleagues in my work group. A lot of what we're collecting is meant to inform sustainable recreation provision, um, maintenance cycles on multi-use trails, kind of the daily operations of the, the department, things of that nature. Okay, so we have a fleet of automated counters out on the system. I think we have 17 at this point. This is showing one of our eco counters. It's a multimodal unit. Um, it can decipher between pedestrians and cyclists. So it's really interesting to see how that does or doesn't change over time on a given trail. Uh, this slide here, I wanted to describe a little bit about how annual average daily visits have changed over time and more specifically to multi-use trails. So, 
A lot of information going on here on the left, the 0, 200, 400, the y axis there is showing what the annual average daily visit is, the gray bars being how we measured it in 2017, and the blue bars, 2020. And the main point I wanted to reflect here, for those trails that you can see here, pretty large increases in visitation between 2017 and 2020. And all of these outlined by red are trails that do allow cyclists. So we believe, although we can't confirm because it wasn't measured per se, is that a lot of the increase that we saw in 2020 on trails that do allow cycling could be related to the launch of the pandemic and people wanting to get outside and cycling becoming a more popular activity here. And then lastly, I wanted to point out if you consider absolute number of people on the system compared to percentages, which is what I was just speaking about, in the oval here, you'll see Chautauqua and Sanitas Valley are two of our trails that were measured in this overtime series that have the greatest number of people. Okay, so who comes to our trail system? And we're gonna focus on cyclists today. So we know from measuring over time who our cyclists are, and what I'm showing here is the most recent data that we have from 2017. Few basic demographics about our cycling community, the average ages, uh, the two biggest categories there between 40 and 59, which is right in line with all of our other measured activities. The bulk of our cyclists are coming from within Boulder County, which also is in line with an 82% average when all activities are combined. And then the one thing that's pretty different with those that do come to cycle on our trail system is that three-fourths identify as male, whereas when we combine everything together, it's pretty much right down the middle, half male and half female. So interesting there, the stereotype holds true on our system that cycling is dominated by males. Okay, and today we're talking a little bit about visitor conflict, so I thought I would give a few statistics here related to conflict that we have measured. During our most recent visitor survey in 2017, we asked everyone about their experiences and whether or not they had experienced a conflict. In all activities combined, all areas combined, we have an average of 6%, so on any given day. And uh, this would include people that never encountered anyone else, uh, since that it's a real thing that occurs on the system, you may or may not encounter somebody else. So, Again, all things considered, we have about a 6% daily conflict rate average. When we break that down and look at who our visitors are reporting is causing the conflict for them, about 2% of that can be attributed specifically to cyclists and another 3% to dogs and dog guardians. Um, so this one, I wanted to break that down a little bit more. So the, the average daily conflict was showing everyone, including those that didn't have a chance to encounter anyone else. And then when someone did encounter someone, we asked them to rate each encounter for every type of activity that they saw during their visit on the day of the survey. So when a certain activity group was encountered, such as dogs or dog walkers, there was a 4% chance that they would encounter a conflict. And the real nugget here is when encountered, they're less frequent on the system, less likely to be encountered, but when encountered, have a greater chance for causing a conflict with, uh, with other visitors, would be the cyclists. Okay, super fun thing that we like to do uh, during our presentations is uh, myth busters, things that continue to be perceptions, long-standing beliefs that people have about what is or isn't happening on the system and that we can ground using all the data that we've collected to create a shared understanding. So one thing that we may hear um, that we're being overrun by out-of-towners and they're all bringing their bikes. So all of these people are coming from all over, they're all coming to open space and they're all using our trail system. When we know um, from close to two decades of measuring residency and activity distributions that 82% of our visitors and more specifically, 86% of our cyclists come from within the county, so that's simply not true. That biking numbers are exploding, this one also isn't true. Um, it's true that overall visitation numbers in an absolute sense have gone up, but 
the proportion of our visitors that are cycling for close to two decades now has ranged between 9 and 11 percent, extremely stable. And the same thing with visitor conflict. Um, we hear pretty regularly that visitor conflict must be increasing. There's more people, more types of activities, all of these things are going on. When in reality, this is another one that we've measured for close to two decades, and the average daily conflict rate has ranged only 2%, between 5 and 7% over those close to 20 years. And this one actually is true. So biking on OSMP is dominated by men. This might be a stereotype that exists in other areas of the nation or the world, but in fact, that one is true. Uh, Three-fourths of our cyclists identify as men. So the next thing I'm gonna cover is trail condition monitoring. We have a pretty hefty interval system going on with Jake Engelman in my work group leading that where every five years he covers the whole system segment by segment monitoring conditions of the trails, including of course, those that are multi-use. And so he looks at things such as compliance with grade, outslope, width, all the things listed there and combines them all into an index for each segment and then combines all of those into an overall index for the trail type. And you can see in this slide here, separated by cycling is or isn't allowed. And the point I wanted to drive home here, because of um, cycling trails generally being newer and in areas that are less steep, um, have more design on the background end of things, and updated design specs themselves, very stable over time, so what this slide is showing is that cycling trails using the measuring system that we have reflect overall better conditions than trails that don't allow cycling. Again, that's probably related to the fact that a lot of our no cycling trails were inherited. The legacy trails that I mentioned tend to be in more steep areas, more prone to erosion, things of that nature. Okay. So some wonderful pictures that Jake sent me, these are all gonna be showing areas on our system that are multi-use allowed. So cyclists can go here, same, same locations over time, given the system that he uses for monitoring condition and kind of spitting ba them back out in these improved, similar and degraded. So this one is showing the same location between 2015 and 2019 where it has improved. And this one showing pretty similar uh, conditions between 2015 and 2019. And then one where we've seen the condition degrade. And it's a little dark on the right there, but what it's showing is areas of muddy trail, there's braiding, there's some undesignated trails developing. So in a sense, overall degraded. Okay, so all this data that we collect, why are we collecting it or what are we using it for? <laughs> So we believe um, having system scale kind of sy systematically collected data that represents conditions across all the various landscapes, all the types of people that we see, everything that goes on is the best way to support a shared understanding between agency staff and the public that we serve. And everyone has their own beliefs about what's going on, but when we all can point to a systematically collected and unbiased data set representing the thing, be it visitation, visitors, or what's going on related to conflict always supports a shared understanding. And we use all this information then to inform planning, operations, everything that we have going on in the department, including adaptive management and transparency and what we're up to. We're using it actively to develop new potential visitor use management strategies, such as se separating activities in time or space and then to establish relationships between recreation and all the other things that we, that we, that we manage for as an open space department. Okay, so looking to the future with our monitoring and potential visitor use. As I said, we have a system scale visitation study going on now. We're looking at um, both visitor attributes through the survey as well as counting people. So collectively, we'll be able to update all the stats that I've shared in this presentation, as well as be able to separate out any change over time in particular locations. And then the trail condition that Jake conducts, again, is on an interval cycle. He's in the middle of one right now, 2019 to 2023, and then that will start right over um, in 2024. 
And into the future, we are actively um, planning on using spatial and temporal separation up in the northern tier of our system when we get to implementing a trail study area up there. We're looking at potentially some single use trails, directional travel, and definitely gonna be continuing our muddy trail closures, our intentional design process, our volunteer events that bring people out to help build and or maintain multi-use multi trails. And in 2022, I believe we're starting the conversation to talk about e-bike access on our system. And with that, I wanted to end with thank yous and acknowledge, acknowledgements. So my team here, they do great work every day to help support understanding our visitors and visitation and how they're distributed on the system. And thank you to the trail staff, Jake, Chad, and everyone else that helped me with this presentation today in general context. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. Great presentation and uh, lots of interesting solutions and lots of challenges and questions for us to look at in the discussion part of the panel today. Uh, our final speaker is Kurt Kruger, and he is co-founder and director of Trail Partners. It's a San Francisco Bay Area collaboration of user groups, and they developed a program called Stop and Say Hello, which uh, is a safety and resource protection program. For more than eight years, he's worked with public land managers to gain their support in making the program their primary uh, trail safety effort. His work also includes workshops for high school mountain bike teams, uh, and it's expanded, including equestrians, hikers, and other uses. In addition to having engineering skills, Kurt has four decades of marketing experience, so it's a great combination, Kurt. Uh, Kurt? And hello. Uh, as Den as uh, <clears throat> uh, was said, it was a program developed in the San Francisco Bay Area to address trail conflicts. I'd like to start with a three minute video to give you a sense of what we're doing and then talk about what uh, I've learned and how to start a similar program in your area. And finally, I'll explain how we started and what the program is today. So let's start with the video. The biggest change I've seen is a lot more, a lot more use generally across the disciplines, and and with and the advent of bikes out on the trails and fire roads. Uh, my name is John McConnellog, and I'm a ranger with the Marin Municipal Water District. Uh, Rich Peterson, and I'm here representing the uh, Tamil Pius High School mountain biking team. My name is Suzanne Gooch, and I'm uh, out here representing the equestrian community. I'm Katie Rice. I'm a Marin County supervisor. I represent the Ross Valley, and I'm also a Marin County native. Grew up in Mill Valley and have hiked and ridden horses and biked and taken my dog all over the trails and fire roads of this great open space for the last half century. Well, I think it's a great campaign to bring awareness to the challenges we have of shared use on the trails. And the Slow to Say Hello campaign is great because it reinforces this idea that you have to be able to slow down enough to be able to say hello to somebody as you pass by. And it's amazing when, they, when the kids do that, it really diffuses things on the trail. I wanna say, what, a few years ago, our bike community, our hiking community, our equestrian community, members of those communities that really saw the need to raise the bar in terms of how we interact out on the trails and came up with this collaborative idea and brought it to the County of Marin and the Marin County uh, Marin Parks and Open Space to um, you know, get behind a campaign that's about building courtesy and community out on the trails. I've been a part of Slow and Say Hello as um, a representative of the Water District um, as part of the public outreach. It's been fantastic. I think uh, it's been great to see not only the agencies and the user groups working together, but more important than that is it really is helpful to the public and um, helping to see the, you know, the, the message get out to the public. And I've seen it, uh, I've seen it firsthand in a lot of these busy areas where we see a more higher traffic. Uh, especially Phoenix Lake, Lake Lagunitas, but we've seen an improvement with relations between different user groups on the mountain. Really stunning how much the hiking and biking community appreciated getting to understand uh, horses and equestrians out on the trails. 
actually did not know that horses didn't perceive riders the same way that they perceive pedestrians or, or hikers. So it was a real thing to learn. And ever since then, I've gone out of my way to stop and get off my bike whenever I encounter an equestrian and you know talk to them. Or at least, you know, if, if I'm riding up slowly to them, I, I talk to them first uh, before the horses get skittish and ask the riders if it's okay to ride by. I can feel it out there, and I've been walking these hills and trails for decades. I invite you to learn from our experience. We've had eight years of study and ongoing improvement. We've hosted education outposts all across California uh, on a variety of trails, trail types, different land managers. We've also gone to public events and a range of private groups. So what are the takeaways? Trail conflict has two main causes, more people and more speed. The biggest trigger for the safety issues is more people. Then as tensions grow, there's a greater disrespect for others, and with that, less concern for the environment. The initial response in most areas includes these failed strategies. Make everything multi-use, bad bikes, enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. In some places, they keep trying these same things over and over again. What did Einstein say about doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result? insanity. So how do you develop a program that works? Like any venture, you and your team must first understand the issue. As a land manager, you should accept that trail conflict runs counter to your mission. You must know what user groups use your trails, and this is important. You should assess what stage of conflict exists on your trail network. Different strategies apply depending on your stage of conflict. And finally, your education program should be guided by an understanding of how people accept information and how they learn. I'll explain each of these points. A significant result of trail conflict is displacement. We may hear from angry equestrians or even hear of accidents, but displacement flies under the radar. Displacement occurs among all user groups, but it also impacts the very groups inclusion is all about, the elderly, families, and the infirm. Accidents, environmental damage. Once conflict uh, uh, angers trail users, there's a loss of respect for others, for authority, and for the environment. So let me go through each of these. Target audience, user groups. Knowing your target user groups is important to customizing your messaging and enlisting partner organization. Stages of trail conflict. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail here other than to say that initially most areas have little or no conflict. As trails get more crowded, conflicts increase and hostility grows. Eventually, perhaps years later, it reaches a tipping point and the responsible user groups seek a solution. Education based. All of our experience points to education as the key to improving safety and resource protection. But how do people learn? Is it the same for everyone? This graphic comes from the EPA. People generally fit into three groups. The group on the left will always obey the rules if they know them. The group on the right generally ignores the rules and will only respond to enforcement. But the largest group will do the right thing if they know what that is and understand the reason for it. Most Americans are in that group. We target our message where it will do the most good group, where it will do the most good the groups that will respond if we explain the reasons. So moving forward, to be successful, uh, we found that all user groups must support the program. And then the land managers must be on board too. So how do you get broad support? I know of three approaches that have worked. There may be others. In the case of our program, it resulted from an accident and the huge public outcry that followed. Another approach is to bring mountain bike groups on board by making access to trails contingent upon active support of the safety program. 
The best approach, in my opinion, is for national organizations to promote a nationwide safety program. The Leave No Trace program is an example of an effective nationwide program. I'm going to switch gears and talk about how the Slow and Say Hello program started and evolved into the success it is today. In the early 70s, that's 50 years ago, mountain bikes appeared on a local mountain. Initially, the issues were minor as mountain bike users enjoyed the outdoors alongside all other trail users. However, as more people and more bikes crowded onto the same trails, conflicts grew. 25 years after mountain bikes appeared on the trails, the hostility among user groups was severe. Then a tragedy occurred. A woman, Lisa, was thrown off her horse after two mountain bikers sped toward her around a blind corner. Lisa landed hard and broke several vertebrae. She was evacuated by helicopter, spent weeks in the hospital, and lost a full year of work. It changed everything. Three groups came together the Marin County Bicycle Coalition, the Horse Council, and the Conservation League. Although the three organizations had fought each other for years, we agreed to work together and speak with one voice on two goals, trail safety and resource protection. I wanna take just a second to emphasize the importance of the resource component of our program. The amount of land and nature will never grow. It's a fixed resource. However, the number of visitors to that land does grow. We have a responsibility to protect our lands and its creatures, not just for us and our children, but for their children and generations to come. Back to our group. It wasn't easy. It took us almost a year of weekly meetings before two things happened. We developed trust with one another, and we realized that each of us did not understand the safety needs of other user groups. And that's key. User groups don't understand the needs of other groups. What we have and what we wanted, the current conditions, we worked to understand what existed on the trails and in what way were these behaviors unsafe or harmful to habitat. We coupled that with desired behaviors. For example, fast moving users such as joggers, trotting horses, mountain bikers, etc., often believe a trail conflict occurs only when there's an accident, a broken bone or blood. In fact, seniors, moms with kids or others who are not agile can be so startled by fast moving trail users that they stop using that trail. Accidents are rare but incidents are common and usually don't get reported. So what happens when people perceive danger, they don't come back. What occurs is displacement. Another key finding, hikers routinely say hello or talk to each other when passing. This humanizes the encounter with others and fosters communication. Promoting active two-way communication between trail users is the single most important factor in creating safe encounters on the trail. Once hostility exists among user groups, then education is only possible from members within that same group. This is critically important in changing behavior. When passing, individuals on the trail should establish between themselves what is safe based on the terrain, the circumstance of their meeting, and whatever other factors are present at that moment, at that place, and at that time. The yield signs don't always work. We prefer active communication to establish safety on the trails. For example, these bikes moved off the trail to allow the horses to pass. However, sometimes it's safer to have the horse stop and let the bikes ride past. It depends on the terrain, number of riders, and sight lines. The rider should make that call rather than trying to follow preset rules. And sometimes there are no rules for what should happen next. Another example about communication, a jogger comes up behind a hiker. Hiker hears on your right, the hiker moves to the right. We found 50% of hikers don't know what on your right means. What's the result? A collision. Yelling instructions is not communicating. Communicating means a two-way exchange. It doesn't have to be words. It could be a nod or a wave, but it does have to be two-way. Our slogan, Slow and Say Hello, promotes communication between trail users. That's the single most important step in creating a safe trail encounter. It also leads users to determine what is safe at that moment, 
and at that place on the trail. We've all seen these signs everywhere. Here's one way to make those signs safer. We developed the slogan, put yourself in my shoes. We use it to develop targeted messages for each user group. We developed a trifold folder. Each panel, hiker, horse, and bike was written by users from that group. The back of the panel, I'm sorry, put yourself in my shoes is a continuing thing. The back of the panel, carries the logos of the five area land managers who support our program. The left panel is about wildlife. We are visitors to the outdoors for a short time, but the wildlife and flora live there. It's their home. We have a moral obligation to preserve and protect it all. Okay, we know what we're trying to achieve, safety and resource protection, but how do we change behavior? Just telling people what to do doesn't work. We began hosting outposts Uh, at trailheads, always manned by all three user groups, hikers, mountain bikers, and equestrians. We'd approach people to try to talk to them about trail safety. 90% told us they already knew about safety. They were in a hurry to meet a friend. Bye. We needed a new approach. So we came up with the trail quiz. We'd say, how'd you like to take a short trail quiz? Get two answers right, and you win a prize from our table. Now 90% of the people stop, and the discussion begins. Some of the questions are designed to challenge and show people that they don't know as much as they thought they did. For example, you approach a horse and rider while riding a bike on a trail, on which side should you pass? Or you encounter a puddle completely across the trail, do you go around it or through it? Uh, at that point, most people become engaged and will spend 10 or 20 minutes learning more about safety and the resources around them. By the way, you ask the rider on which side to pass their horse. Most of them don't care, but some horses do. And going through the puddle is preferred because going around it makes the trail wider. We've developed a training program for high school mountain bike race teams. We start with a 30 minute talk about horse physiology, including prey and predator concepts and what makes a horse spook. We also ask them why we have public trails instead of more houses. Then we put the kids on a horse and lead them around. Wow, no handlebars. The kids love it. We also demonstrate safe passing skills and have the students try it themselves. Slow and Say Hello is the safety program developed by Trail Partners, a collaboration of the Marin Horse Council, the Marin County Bicycle Coalition, uh, and the Marin Conservation League. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Um... Kurt and all the other presenters. I'm going to go ahead and get the resources slide up on my end and uh, before we get into the Q&A. So you guys do still have time to enter, um, to, you know, ask any questions that you might have and um, and uh, I will, sorry, I will work with the presenters following the webinar um, to, to answer all of the questions in writing for any that we do not get to. So if all the presenters are able to pull up their webcams, I know um, some of uh, their internet connections may not allow you to, so we definitely understand that. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get to the first question. And this question actually, um, I'll start with uh, Dion for this, because I, this question came up during your presentation from Diamiris. Um, what are the strategies used to obtain user feedback? Some mentioned were surveys, but how were they administered? Um, at park, online, um, what, what information do you have to provide for that question, Dion? We'll start with you. And just a reminder to unmute yourself as well. <laughs> there we go, it wasn't allowing me to unmute. <laughs> Uh, the visitor survey that I mentioned, uh, we conduct every five years. It's an on-site intercept where we're intercepting visitors at access points at the end of their trip. So they've just been to open space. It's meant to represent the characteristics of themselves and their experiences that day. And then we aggregate them for the statistics that I shared. Great. Does anyone else have any Anything to add to that question on how you guys administer surveys and get feedback? I 
for the Silver Star planning process, we um, created a survey and worked with our trail user group partners and the agencies to publicize it throughout the trail community. So it doesn't give us the intercept data that would be nice, but it was a lot easier to administer. Great, okay. Um, Randy asks, a width of trail seems to be an issue. By widening trails, can we decrease conflict while still being environmentally, uh, environmentally responsible? Anyone have any any answers yeah, to that offer, question? <laughs> I can offer a comment on that. Um, sight lines are, are critically important. Um, so width of the trail is definitely a factor, but so is the height of the vegetation, if any, around. And if there are curves or hills or so forth that cause sight line issues, um, that creates uh, potentially dangerous intersections. Um, so yeah, that's a strategy that can help reduce conflict. Great. Okay. There's a couple questions. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm so sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I think it's a good strategy in some instances where, particularly where you have two-way traffic and multi-use trails, but I hear a lot of comments from hikers and mountain bikers who prefer that narrow, tight, twisty trail. You know, good sight lines are important, but um, the narrowness of the trail gives a sense of wildness and can be uh, important in a sense of play for a lot of mountain bikers. Thank you. Uh, we have a, uh, this may be directed toward Dion, since Dion, you had mentioned the textured trail tread, and we have a couple comments and questions on this. Um, we'll ask the first one, I guess, in your purposes, um, is for the texturite from Janet, texturite trail tread, um, was it used for erosion control or was it for some other purpose? Do you know that answer? <laughs> So let me caveat, I am not a trail specialist, um, but in speaking with my trail colleagues, I believe it can serve many functions, one of which is uh, drainage or the erosion control. I think the biggest factor that contributes to erosion is the water. Um, so yeah, creating that uneven surface. So it's, it's, it's draining the water, it's providing a variance to the, to the biker and some uh, greater challenge, maybe getting over the surface, as well as mitigating speed. So it's doing a lot of things all at once. Great. I know Dave had a comment on that. Um, uh, do other trail maintainers see texturized trails as speed reducers? Um, he mentioned here on Vancouver's North Shore, they are used heavily to manage erosion. But since rocks do get slippery, riders mostly avoid breaking on them and often end up going pretty fast. Um, so that's a great comment um, there. Uh, another question we have is, I think, I think that this is a question for Deanne, so I apologize, another question for you, Deanne, but from Justin, to confirm the data you showed that suggesting biking has not increased um, from, two, from 2017 and prior, was there no data from the last four to five years? The data that we have for activity types goes all the way back at a system wide scale and for a 12, like an entire, collected for an entire year across the whole system, collected the first time in 2004, 2005, and then again in 2010, 2011, 16, 17, and we actually have it going again right now. So, what is that fourth or fifth iteration of that system scale 12 month or longer data collection period? And we know for all of those data collection, <clears throat> excuse me, periods, those that identify cycling as their primary activity has only ranged that 2% between 9 and 11% of our total visitor population. So the data that we have is quite extensive and I would say by, by now is a trend for sure that um, we're hovering around the 10% mark for cycling on our system. Okay. Maybe I'll direct this question towards Bob, for or I'm not really exactly sure, but it's in regards to e-bikes. Whitney has a question about, we are currently trying to develop an e-bikes policy for a municipal open space division. And due to perceptions, many folks want to completely ban e-bikes on mountain bike trails. What are the best attributes of trails to designate for e-bikes? You know, how is that enforced? Do you see users generally deferring to the selected trails? Are they allowed on all multi-use trails? 
does anyone have any comments um, on what you guys are doing that that will or do allow e-bikes? You are muted, Mike, uh, Bob, if you are trying to talk. I'm trying to see if I can help you, actually. Oh, there here, we are. Hold on. There okay. we go. <laughs> that's, that's better. Yeah, just, uh, and I'm sure the others have comments about this with e-bikes. Um, you know, I think we're going to see increasing usage. I, I have my own personal bias about e-bikes. Um, I think the concern with e-bikes is is really weight and speed, uh, particularly uh, the you know there's three classes of e-bikes, but the, but the larger, heavier ones. So I, I really think on backcountry trails we want to limit the weight so it's comparable to the weight and speed of a of a pedaled uh, mountain bike. Um, having said that, also just in my opinion, I I really encourage people unless they need an e-bike because of a, a, a disability um, or limitation on their capacity. Uh, to me, it's just preferable to be human powered. Um, and that's not to knock people traveling by e-bikes. E One comment, I think adding e-bikes in, which is a double-edged ed sword, it's a good thing and a bad thing. It's going to increase usage and popularity sub significantly regardless. And so I think, you know, that's going to expand our need to kind of build on and learn from our presenters today in ways to manage uh, those interfaces. I'd like to add to that the <clears throat> comment I made earlier that uh, people from one type of user group don't understand the safety needs of other user groups. Um, with the occurrence of e-bikes, my anecdotal experience is that you have a whole new class of people who haven't been out on the trail very much before and they have even less understanding of the safety needs of others around them. So it just emphasizes the need for greater education um, about the fact that they're not alone out on the trail. Great, thank you. I know that we're over our time actually, so I do apologize. We have some more great questions I was trying to look through for a quick answer, but what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to be working with the presenters again to get all of the unanswered questions, put them in writing as well, and then we will share that with all of the attendees um, in my follow-up email. And also, you are welcome to reach out to the presenters um, if you would like a quicker answer. But I will be sharing all of the questions that came in, um, the rel uh, relevant questions with the presenters to get answers to them, and, sh and also sharing that on our website. So. Um, again, I do want to thank um, the main sponsor, not only our presenters, but I want to thank the main sponsor of the webinar for today, Rhino Marking and Protection Systems, as well as our additional webinar partners that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the U.S. Forest Service, as well as the National Park Service. And if you are enjoying these webinars, um, I'd like for you to consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for Trails to 44321. Your donation will go to the Trail Fund, which is a new grant program of American Trails. Um, it helps enable us to build a fund dedicated to maintaining and enhancing America's trails through maintenance, research, and stewardship training projects. And um, as it notes on the slide, I will be, um, those who donate immediately following this webinar, I will be selecting a few winners. I'm gonna select um, more than usual, because we have over 1,100 people registered for this webinar, which is pretty exciting. It's um, definitely our top um, attended webinar for this year. So that's pretty exciting as we round out the, the year. Um, um, and getting back to that, <laughs> getting back to the trail fund though, I want to mention that we will be opening up applications to apply for funding for your projects in early 2022. So you can learn more about that at americantrails.org. Um, a direct link is also thetrailfund.org. And you can email trailfund at americantrails.org to be put on the list to find out more when applications um, are available. Last, I would like to invite you to join us for this upcoming webinar. Again, our last webinar being held in 2021. Uh, you can register for it today, and of course, it is free. So thank you again to everyone for attending and for your interest in this topic. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and happy trails.